everyone. Hello. Thank you so much for being here online in person. Uh, this week, we'll be discussing the rise of the Kamakura period, uh, and particularly the uh, to introduce Kamakura Buddhisms. Uh, those are Jodoshu, Jodoshinshu, uh, Rinzai, and Soto Zen, and Nichiren Buddhisms. Uh, even without these massive changes in Japanese Buddhism itself, this era, the Kamakura era, is already infamous for the breadth of change uh, that occurred in Japan at the time. The Kamakura period, kind of 12th to 14th centuries, um, brought about a huge shift uh, historically, socially, and culturally. And what I hope to convey is that Buddhism reflected that shift. <clears throat> Therefore, what I, I want to go over uh, together can be vastly summarized through discussing the three seats of power in Japan at the time. Looking at these um, it can provide a little insight into what was going on uh, leading up to these massive changes. Those three seats of power were the emperor, uh, the imperial court, and the aristocracy on the whole. Then what initiated the dawn of the Kamakura period, the establishment of the shogunate, being the second seat of power, and finally Buddhism on the whole, uh, the teachings, the institution of Buddhism, and historical figures that we'll, we'll explore in future discussions. And how all these three seats of power set the stage for the changes we see in the Buddhist schools, reflected in the Buddhist schools. Because in large, Kamakura Buddhism can be viewed as a response to the changes coming out of the Han era. If anything else, I hope that that's what is taken away from this particular discussion, because that has been a trend of Buddhism in its history thus far. It's shifting to the needs, needs of leaders in society up to this point in large part, but now more to the needs of the people. And the developments in new schools of Japanese Buddhism are emblematic of that tendency to adapt and shift. As you might imagine, there has been a, a lot of history since the last time, the, since our last discussion of Saicho and Kukai's trip to China. That was the end of the 8th century, start of the 9th. Um, and so nearly 250 years has gone by, and that's almost uh, that's longer than America's history as a country. And, and how much we change. So there's a lot happened in Japan. Uh, and again, I'm, I can't go over all of it, so I won't. Um, but for the purposes of moving, uh, moving along, um, thank you. Uh, a little bit about the Heian Imperial Court. Uh, during this period, Japan saw, again, from our last discussion, we saw a huge influx of culture and government poetry, art, architecture, yeah, religion, um, and most as cultural imports from China. But by the beginning of the 10th century, Japan cut ties from China, China's influence and spends the next 200 years in relative isolation and peace. We'll call it peace. And this led to somewhat of a stagnant, <laughs> but an insulation, I'll say, of the Japanese culture. And so a certain amount of refinement but it was mostly through aristocratic means and, and sponsorship, all saved for the culture aspects saved for the upper classes. And therefore, all the main cultural influences going on in Japan up until that point, in, in those regards, were left to those upper classes. And in fact, so much so that over time in the, during the Han period, those in court gave themselves more to those cultural endeavors rather than actually governing or actually administering over this young nation and all the provinces that have now it, it's now encompassed, let alone supporting a military. So over the length of the Han period, it's more obvious that there was a disconnect between the aristocracy and commoners of Japan. And over that time, resentment started to grow towards those in the capital. For a young developing nation, not controlling, not administering over a growing wider geographical area made up of numerous provinces would have let some of the more distant ones 
much more to their own devices. And these provinces in various areas of Japan would be growing, population and otherwise, as, as was their wealth and education, and status, etc. The trend on the whole over the hand period could be seen loosely as a growth of the middle class, trying to take it out of the Western concepts of what we think of as a middle class, but, and maybe even just kind of a, the starting of a middle class, or maybe even more generally some sort of social mobility, <laughs> which, main, which was not as present before. And, <clears throat> um, and uh, so these provinces became powerful in their own right in this growth, and Japan would, was still fairly volatile and, and dangerous. Um, and folks still needed means of protecting their lands, their goods, themselves. And welcome in the early concepts of a held militia, a warrior class, and yeah, eventually samurai. This was still a very clan-based system in these provinces, and, and du duty and loyalty um, prevailed as the main causes, and, and many of you can kind of label as, as uh, Confucian ideals. Uh, but back in the court, history stuff is happening. The, there's power plays of all sorts for vying for the role of emperor. The Fujiwara clan, um, our controlling is controlling the court behind the scenes, but mostly it's all just oligarchy stuff going on, um, all being it, albeit for vying for control in different ways. Again, a lot of history there, but that's that's all in the capital, in, in, in a place presumably far away from most Japanese. If if you were any other Japanese, you you probably don't care what's going on in the capital. You you worry more about your own community and your town and your clan, your own needs. And that's how these provincial areas started to really develop. And by the 10th century, the provinces of the Kanto area here on the west side, the green areas, um, had grown in their power and consolidated some of that power and sufficiently to hold a, what would become a, su a substantial army. And up rises the Minamoto clan. And there is another clan, the Taira clan, and they're over in red on the on the west coast. And they fought each other, and the Genpei War happened, and there's other historical details here. Uh, but in the end, the Minamoto clan comes out on top. And I bring all that up for context, yes, but really to bring up this guy. Uh, this is Minamoto no Yoritomo. Yoritomo is a, a character, again, historical details, um, chiefly in my, my, in my mind sticks out that he killed a lot of people, um, mostly kind of competition, or what he thought might be competition. Anyway, um, but what you really need to know about him is that he's, he's the Minamoto general who would become Shogun. And, and he, he is what embarks the Kamakura period with his installation of a parallel military-based government system and that he housed um, in, in the Minamoto capital of Kamakura. Uh, and just as a, an aside, Kamakura is, would be, if you can see the little two, um, you see the big kind of inlet of water. That's, that is the Kanto area. Tokyo would be at the, the northernmost tip of that, and Kamakura would be just west of that number two. Uh, no, I'm sorry, just east of that number two. Um, so in the big inlet there. So pretty far from Kyoto, which would have been near number 12, which is very, very much dead center of the of the map there, if you can see that. It's in the blue. It's in the blue. Yes, thank you. Sorry. Yes. <clears throat> um, and and this the, the advent of the shogunate brought on huge amounts of change. It was a complete revolution in all aspects of Japanese life, not just political, social, moral, religious. It, it, it should be noted that there was 
ideas of revolution already brewing. Um, a, a somewhat stagnant 200 years of isolation might do that. Um, but change was coming. And his rise to power was the spark to the powder keg. To say nothing of massive plagues and uh, disease and uh, a lot of other catastrophes, but uh, I digress. Perspectives were changing. The lower classes had, had more opportunity, more aspirations. They wanted more agency. And, and now for, for many, there, there was a world of possibility that they may not have had previously. The, the advent of this character, of uh, uh, Yoritomo, um, he has his own story, but he becomes kind of a, a model of this, uh, you can achieve amazing things, you know, um, by slaughtering a lot of people. But um, so, uh, okay. And for Buddhism's part, the, the court's power was waning and seen as both Tendai and Shingon, and in fact, all the other remaining Nara schools were at the service of the court, they too generally over time fell out of public favor. All that, uh, all that Buddhism was inaccessible to the common Japanese. I mean, li literacy for one is a good impediment, um, but just the, the time, energy, effort in studying and practicing Buddhism, it was and may still seem not always available to everyone. And like, like most cultural phenomena of the time, it was reserved to the elites. And this, and, and this Kamakura sh period shift changes a lot of that. Because out of the, these uprisings and the new social mobility, cultural change, uh, and, and I have to at least mention here Mapo, um, the concept of the age of the latter or degenerate Dharma, over time, Buddhism becomes less focused on ceremonies and esotericism and more on devotion and practice. Less dogma and more experience. Less ritual and more faith. And this approach is what could reach, supposedly, all the levels of class, all the classes. And that's a big change. For example, Pure Land schools focused on faith and devotion in Amida, and Zen focused on practical experiences of meditative insight. As we will see in, in our future discussions about Zen, the Zen schools particularly, they too also become more popular and influential by fulfilling a role of helping to provide a morality and discipline to the samurai and in the entire warrior class. So there is still a certain amount of uh, supporting the powers that be. Uh, it had a purpose, at least. Uh, and in short, nope, that's it, that's it. Um, in short, as we explore the new schools of Japanese Buddhism originating in the Kamakura period, we will see this interplay of the three seats of power, the emperor and the court, the shogunate, and Buddhism. But what I want to stress again, the, the developments of new Buddhisms, meaning these schools of Kamakura Buddhism, may be seen as a reaction to a perceived need. The Buddha Dharma is still and has always been a, a tool and, and a flexible one. It, it takes on different shapes and sizes, approaches and perspectives. And what I hope to convey in future discussions is, is that all these schools don't have to represent a shift away from traditional teachings. Although we could argue that some of the founders did truly want a, a shift away or a leaving of Tendai or the establishment norm. But the new school's interaction, the in, intentions, the new school's intentions are similar. They, they still are trying to relieve dukkha, discontentedness, uh, uh, suffering, pain. And, and I might argue that Tendai could have done more for the for a larger populace, and it, in general it did, and, and for Japan on the whole, but it had to be stifled. It must have felt stifled by the court's exclusive, exclusivist adaptation of their functionary role through ceremony and ritual. 
we have to assume that Buddhism as an institution had to play to the powers that be and hence how it how it was being used and therefore manifested but as a need arose for more accessible teachings particular figures latched on to that social and or cultural trend and charismatically encouraged their single practice but those teachings can be seen as a, a, a refinement of what was already there. As religious people, we seek ways to tap in, to connect, and have our needs met, to be able to refine ourselves and experience, hopefully, solace. The developments of Kamakura Buddhism's provided ways to connect that can be found in Tendai. But at the time, access to Tendai teachings seemed out of reach. So the new Buddhisms provided a seemingly new and improved way of using Buddhism. However, their concepts aren't new, weren't new. It, it's just being rebranded and, and kind of repackaged with a lot more accessibility for the general population. The Buddhist philosophy was already embedded culturally in Japan, but now the, the, the Japanese people had ways of experiencing a transformation for themselves. Even the new, new schools of Japanese Buddhism, which tends to be the last 200 or, 200 or so years, you know, let's define new, um, the, the, they, even present day, seem to be much more lay-based systems. We'll see that in Rishikosakai, um, Sogakakai, uh, for example. But those who study in those schools and go further into the Lotus Sutra teachings, for example, still run into Tendai teachings and Saicho and Tiantai teachings and Jiri. That's how Kaida came to us. These new schools are seemingly just new ways to allow a different I don't know, maybe easier ways in. Because, frankly, look how far down the rabbit hole you've gone. <laughs> it's gone down in just a short time. And more than anything, it speaks to the rise in the need for a broader social means of cohesion and solace to, to fill the needs of the people. A wider range of people up and down the social strata were looking for something more than just smells and bells, more than just ritual. <clears throat> we reflect that here with our Sangha's participation in, in the service in the Hondo. Based on American sensibilities, and we could always argue about where those originated, but it, it would not feel, I presume, a, as engaging to just sit and watch those in robes do the service being done. And yet, despite the huge Kamakura evolution that we'll be discussing in the next several months, in Japan's approach to Buddhism, in, a, in an overall laitization, um, it, Buddhism still, it's still the case that priests play an intermediary role for the lady. Faith and practice have provided the lady more personal agency, but the clergy in Japan still hold, hold on to the ceremony and services that historically have always been a functionary role of Buddhism in Japan. We will see that although the, the founders of these new schools may have had extreme views or wanting to move away from the old systems, over time, those very schools that they developed still accommodated the social norms of an Amida service for a funeral at a Zen temple, or a town Shinto festival starting and ending at the village's local Nichiren temple. Beyond any school's particular teachings, 
they still provided what was deemed necessary in large part by the society, the Sangha, the people in need. What does that mean for us here? I might assume that many of us don't necessarily think about what role the Buddhist teachings have in our society, to say nothing of what role clergy, Buddhist clergy, has in America. Maybe you do, but at least I, I, I do, I certainly do. Uh, call it an occupational hazard? No. No. Uh, this is my application, so it's not an occupational hazard, I guess. Because it's not, it's an application for me here. It, it's something that I do. Um, sometimes I wish it could be my vocation, my job. Sometimes I do wish I, it could allow me to do this full time. And sometimes that's what it's like for many priests in Japan. Now, many hold outside jobs outside the temple. But for all intents and purposes, the role as a priest, it's a job. And, and Tendai Shu in Japan is seeing the problem with that concept uh, in, in their society over time. But societally, historically, that's the role it's acquired there. Here, it's a little different. And frankly, this is why I love studying with Monshin Sensei. Because he's trying to say, given all this Tendai doctrine, practice, history. How does it translate to this place to help transform our perspectives, our ideas, and our needs? That's tough, because underlying all of this is Sangha. It is us doing it together, and we need that help. Societally, again, culturally, our communities, they need something. And at TBI, we try to provide what we can. And we take, take this Sangha's guidance in, in doing that. And we're all, what we're trying to say in all these talks, in these discussions, these examples, this history lessons, the, our service, our meditations, this community, is to say, Look, look how Buddhism can work here. Look at what Tendai is. Does that work for you? <laughs> you know, uh, and, and hopefully it, it can. Can you feel some comfort in that? Can you, does it allow you to kind of tap in a little bit? Hopefully some solace. It, great, good. I'm, I'm so glad. Now take that and go off and do it everywhere else. Because that's what we're, we're, we're trying to get to. In the end, us, the Sangha, are the only reason why Buddhism has continued. People have believed. And therefore have shaped what Buddhism has become. That, 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 that's it. That it, it has become what it has needed to be. And it will continue to do so. And therefore, what I put onto you is... As you consider all the information we tend to give to you every work week, and man, do we work hard on it. it. We're just, how to best, how can we understand where Buddhism and Tendai have been in the past so that it can be our rudder for how to move forward? Because here we are in this place doing this thing where everything else around us is seemingly out of control. Considering the trends we just discussed happening in Japan of a change in social demands, what if we took that message and worked to respond to the social needs that are not being addressed or met now? In our society, what ways are people meeting or needing to tap in? How, in what ways do they help, how do we help them facilitate feeling supported? To have a community, to feel solace. As a priest, what role do I have or we have to play in that? Or not? I mean, should we help facilitate that? How? 
As I take a look at uh, uh, take these looks back at time, it provides glimpses of ways to figure out the direction forward. But ultimately, it's still up to all of us, the Sangha. We all help determine what role Tendai plays in our steps forward. And considering its past, what it's what is it's going to be its future? Um and, and frankly, let me know. I mean, again, we're going to be working on doing this together, coachingbauer at gmail.com. No, I mean, I, I don't know. It, we, we have a lot of dukkha, of pain, suffering, discontentedness. We have had long history of people trying to fix that. Centuries of people who also have considered themselves in horrible sociocultural dilemmas thinking they were within the worst of times. This social unrest we experience now is not new, and yet many found answers in the Buddha Dharma, in whatever particular way they interacted with it. That is the beauty of the Ekiyana teaching. There are many ways of relieving that dukkha. We have our ways, our Tendai ways, our Tendai teachings, our practices, but they are nothing if they are not accessible or used. We have dukkha. We experience it. We can experience where it comes from. And importantly, we can know that there is hope and that there is a remedy that we can apply. Those are the Four Noble Truths. That, that's what the new schools of Kamakura Buddhism were providing, another remedy. But a remedy left on the shelf is not fulfilling its function. And in all of the discussions we've already had and we will have about various schools and theories, sutras and commentaries. They're all methods of ways of connecting, of developing compassion, and learning about them and their historical context. Their particular approach helps to understand what remedies we have on our shelf, what teachings or teachings do we go to? What practice or practices do you apply? And in the months to come, we'll go over many of these schools, the, the Kamakura schools, to talk about those. But really, how do we best use Buddhism and Tendai to provide hope and overcome dukkha? How do we provide what people need? Again, koshinbauer at gmail.com. Um, <laughs> thank you so much, everyone. Um, I will open it up. No, I will pause, and and I didn't see Chishima Sensei sign on. Um, I will open it up to uh, Munchin Sensei if there is anything that you um, wanted to say. I was just, I was just going to make a few comments on um, the Kamakura period itself. I mean, I think you did a good job of, of outlining because it's, it's a difficult... Uh, it's a lot to put into a short time. Mm. Um, but one of the uh, two, several things, uh, keep in mind that Japan was a nation somewhat. It was really a collection of clan-based kingdoms that were in different parts of, of Japan. The emperor held it together. The emperor was the state. That's something difficult for us to think about. The emperor was the state. The emperor, the imperial line, had difficulty um, because the imperial family was more concerned upon what was going on in court as opposed to what was going on in the provinces. And the people in the provinces, the leaders of those people, the daimyo specifically, which were the economic lords, if you will, um, so they were really uh, fiefdoms. The economic lords were really uh, needed to 
meet the needs and hence the shogun, which was the shogun literally is is um, a military government. government. The, the emperor did not have an army. <clears throat> the shogun was the army and the militia. And in many cases, the, um, oh, there's a Tishina sensei. And in many cases, the uh, civil authority. And so it's, it, we can think of the, the four main islands as Japan on one hand, but in reality, they really were composed of smaller units that were these economic fiefdoms. And the the money would have, the rice would have gone to the daimyo. The daimyo would then support the imperial family, but the the shogun at the military uh, was responsible for collecting it and distributing it, etc. So that's one of the things to keep about. When we're talking about the three gates of power, the, the imperial family, the shogunate, and Buddhism, you have to keep in mind that Buddhism wasn't just a temple here and a temple there. The temples owned enormous tracts of land. So the Buddhist temples in and of themselves were an economic power. So you had economic power in the emperor, you had economic power in the shogun, you had economic power in the temples. So it wasn't just that Buddhism was sort of hovering over all of this, they were integral to this power relationship by virtue of the fact that they, they owned land. They would rent the land out to farmers. They were the landlords, essentially. They would lend, rent the land out to uh, the merchants. And when Koshin was talking about the middle class, what it really was was a development of the merchant class. And Japan had a caste system that began shortly after this, during this period of time, the common core period. And the merchant was a caste in and of itself. So you had the shogunate, which were the military governors, the military in general. Um, so when someone was a samurai, they were a they owed their allegiance to a particular um, shogun, a particular clan within that shogun. When you had the, um, the the imperial family, they really the imperial family really didn't have power at all. So as he said, when the imperial families, um, the importance of the imperial family began to wane, then Tendai, because of its association with the imperial family, also began to wane. That's and then you had these other schools, such as the, the Zen schools, that saw themselves as now meeting a need to the shogunate. You had the Pure Land schools meeting the needs of the laity uh, because of faith as opposed to practices, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. And so I'm glad that he did this one session just upon the external factors that led to the development of the schools, because I think too often. And I'll, I'll be addressing this tonight in a, in a Dharma talk. I think too often we see the schools developing as uh, ideas and fissioning off when, in fact, there were external factors that led to those schools' development. And we don't often put enough emphasis on those external, fa external factors. The same way that, that, that Tendai became dominant during the beginning of the Heian era, as a result of an emperor had a child who was sick. A Tendai priest uh, cared for that child, did a, did a ceremony that was perceived as helping the child. Um, there, was, there was disease, there, was, there were natural disasters. Uh, Mikyo, the esoteric practices, were seen as a protection to the state. It wasn't just for someone to do it for their own purpose, it was protecting the state. We don't have that concept. It's a totally different foreign concept to us. So we have to sort of put ourselves into that period of time in which the esoteric practices were for the benefit of the nation. The Buddhists who were practicing were not doing it to teach, med ed teach uh, meditation so that we would be calm and, and uh, less, less prone to flying off the handle. Um, they were doing it for themselves so that they could function. <laughs> they weren't out teaching meditation to everybody. That's that's really a 21st century or 20th century at least um, notion. So um, when we think of Kamakura, 
<laughs> and we begin looking at the schools, and I, I guess you're going to do Pure Land mm -hmm. next. Um, we begin looking at the schools, recognize that they didn't come out of the ether. They came out of external conditions which were ripe to make them uh, develop. Okay, so that, that's what, what Hoshin was doing this evening. Ishishima Sensei, we see that you joined us. Did you have any comments on this this evening? Thank you. Well, the Kamakura period is very interesting period. Uh, most of the Japanese Buddhism, like uh, Zen and the uh, Honens, you know, Amitabha worship, Washington's Amitabha worship, etc. And Nichiren, etc. They they are, uh, I think, grown up from Mount Hie. If you visit uh, uh, ten, uh, Dai Kodo lecture hall at uh, Mount Hie, right above the Kompon Chudo, there are many uh, founders of Kamakura period's predecessors. So I think uh, uh, Tendai uh, initiated the Mahayana precept. Uh, instead of uh, Nara Buddhism or uh, Hinayana or such a Pratimoksha, but Japan is more fit uh, to adopt Mahayana precept. So uh, the, this is a basis of, of founding, I think, new Buddhism in Kamakura period. Uh, yes, I think, uh, and also, I know, I, I'm interesting, you know, uh, you showed us the picture of Daibutsu of Kamakura. That Daibutsu is not, uh, it's different from Nara Todaichi uh, giant Buddha. Because Nara, in the Nara's, okay, Todaichi's uh, giant Buddha, uh, this is Vairochana. But uh, Nara Buddhism, this is Amitabha Buddha. You can see the signs. Uh, signs of that, uh, uh, like this, this is uh, uh, Kamakura, this is Amitabha symbols of uh, mudra, hand gesture. Uh, so uh, I think it's uh, interesting to compare uh, both of them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sensei.